Hi there, Fatula here. In this video, we are going to talk about the Agile principle number nine, which might be less easy to understand from the perspective of people who work on the business side of things, but it's nonetheless a very important principle. And just, you know, remember Agile principles, they are 12 and they work together to paint a picture. They are not something that you take out of context. So let's understand today why it's important and how you can show up for helping your people, your teams to work under the understanding of the Agile principle number nine. The Agile principle number nine says, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. I'm not sure if like me, you have noticed that this day and age, all that people like to do is bash the Agile principles and they say Agile is outdated and the principles didn't age very well. Well, I do find that one, you do need to understand the context because it is the, the manifesto for Agile software development. And it's interesting that Agile is used in many other things today. And they talk about business agility and personal agility and all that good stuff but it was really invented and it really pertained to the world of software development. And you also have to remember they are 12. They go together to paint a picture. If you take one out of context, of course it's easily to not see the value in there. So one of the argument is that, well, the customer doesn't ask for software. The customer doesn't care about software. Well, that's very true except when there is a weird law that comes by or some creepy move from an organization trying to get data um, and information about people, then people start thinking about technology. And the reality is that technology is really pervasive. It's everywhere. It's in all the products. So, I mean, yeah, the customer doesn't know and technically doesn't care about technology, but they will be affected by it. Today, we live in the world of technology. That's no escaping that. I'm not sure if you remember, but when iPhone one started, it took three years for the project to really be completed. And the first iPhone, which wasn't much, got out of the door. Now, every six months, you have two models coming up all the time for everybody. And the speed of being able to come up with new products or enhancements to your product is definitely something that the customer responds to. Because if you're not fast enough, they're just gonna go and buy from the competitor. And that, my friend, is technology. And that speed to tending to the customer needs is only possible when great engineering practices are present. And the thing is, it wasn't always like that. There was always this need for spend months talking about and thinking and designing a product. And then time passes and the date, which was always fixed, is coming and now you have only so much time to develop. So managers were constantly encouraging their developers, their teams to just, you know, can you do it quick? Can you do it faster? And the sad part is you would be hard pressed to not find this happening still to this day. It's 2023 and I've still been to places, big names, big organizations where you see asked in many different ways, but management asked, you know, how can we make this faster? almost as in can you make in the you know the dear the dirty and cheap approach the thing is that the dirty and cheap approach you know what it's going to give you right you know it the problem with the quick and dirty is you know dirty and cheap is that there was this idea that we can come back and fix later except that later never happened so when this approach was encouraged quite honestly you didn't have great software being created. You had something that actually was more and more difficult to maintain. So talking about delivering software in that manner is really not possible. In fact, I addressed this briefly when we were talking about the agile principle number one, and that's all about value. And there's a lot of value that can't be seen. Like for example, when your data is properly protected or when you can add new features into your software, virtually, you know, seamlessly and quite fast. And that, my friend, it's really something that only great engineering practices, technical excellence can bring. There are a lot of decisions that belong in the realm of business and the technical team should be kept in the loop. They should understand their customer needs and what is value to the customer but also managers who do not understand how the product is developed 
should not be making decisions that jeopardize what a great product looks like in name of short-term gains. That should be dialogue in there. And the opposite is also true. So when we talk about technical excellence, we should be careful with the um, technical ivory tower. The technical ivory tower is when the product will never be finished because we just keep polishing it. And there are trade-offs, of course, with technical excellence and with good design. And there is a point of diminished return of investment. You know, when you cross that threshold where making it better won't actually, you know, it will cost you more than actually make some more value for your customer. It is possible sometimes that teams are too proactive. You want to protect or make sure that your product is robust for a million users, but then, you know, you still have a few hundred. So you still have a, a few order of magnitudes to get to that threshold. So you shouldn't prepare your application right now to be the most awesomest possible in the world. Now, can you anticipate something and put that into the design? Of course, but then it has to be a matter of choice. And because it's always a matter of investment versus the value that you get out of it, it's a well-informed choice, not a given one, and there is dialogue, business and technology. So we should remember the agile principle number two here about embracing change. The reality is that change will happen. As much as we can protect our product, we can never really predict what are all possible changes that will come. Okay, it's not purism talking calling for technical excellence. It's really just good business. Being technically excellent is important. A more robust product will definitely be able to gracefully accept change uh, better than a, a product that isn't that robust. Now, another thing to think about technical excellence, it's really when you build your product in a manner that they can be changeable, malleable, technical excellence will enhance the ability to change the code, to introduce and interconnect new pieces that will ultimately allow you to service your customer in a more timely manner, new features seamlessly appearing and much faster. So this is a lot of value that is given to your customer. Well, the customer doesn't understand software, but they definitely understand when a product really works well. So I actually wanna, wanna talk a little bit about uh, nomenclature here. You know that there is hardware and software, right? When they came up with those names back many decades ago, the point is that hardware is hard to change. And software, you guess it, it's the soft part. It is malleable. It has to be easy to change. That was the whole concept behind it. You build that heavy structure of your hardware and then you can use it in different ways with your software. Software is easily changeable by definition. So if right now you're having a hard time to add something new for your customers and it takes a very long time, well, it's time to revisit your technical excellence with your teams. So how would you revisit the, this principle with your teams? There are, you know, there's a stance and there is a knowledge. From the perspective of a stance, it, I like to quote a colleague from LinkedIn and he was mentioning script kids. There are script kids and there are software developers. And I was laughing because I could recognize myself as a student, as a script kid. And it basically shows that one thing is doing your solo little project versus operating in a team, in an organizational setting, using best practices and using great software theory behind your product that's made to last a long time and serve people with a purpose. There is a significant difference between school projects and a corporation funded project. The expectation of what they can do, what they can offer, and also their impact will, will greatly vary. And then I mentioned that there is knowledge and the knowledge piece is also important. You wanna have the discussion with the managers and you know, management is about developing, developing your people. So you wanna discuss with your managers that knowledge is not something that your technical team does at home or their free time after dinner. We have to carve the time and find the structure so that knowledge happens at work. Sending people to conferences, having them being trained, but also how that knowledge will come and stay. So as agile coaches and scrum masters, 
we should be creating the dialogue on how to structure all that, the needs and how to structure. Because we are not talking about developing one or two people here. It's about how we manage knowledge for our teams in general. We know that people will move on on the hierarchy or be promoted or just leave the company. And you want to make sure that knowledge is something that compounds, that stays, and it makes the product great and the people great. And also there is the team part on this. Of course, you develop yourself individually, but you also develop as a team. As a coach, what you're going to be doing is working with them, not only on retrospective, but when things go a little bit south, maybe during a delivery or maybe with a weird bug, something will be happening at the technical level that will prompt the conversation. And in that case, you really want to make sure that you grab that opportunity and make the team rethink. So it's all about the questions that you'll be asking. It doesn't need to be in a, in a retrospective, but it's how to ask the questions and how to make the team not only answer to make sure that they are, you know, that problem, that issue will never happen again. They really learn from whatever happened and they adapt. So their processes, how they do CI, CD will be a little bit different. How they review the code, the things that they allow in the code will be a little bit different. So you really want to see change and adaptation happening. It's not just information in the head. You have to have adaptation happening across the team. So that was what I wanted to share with the Agile principle number nine in this video. And I do know that Agile is now across domains. I know you might be maybe a scrum master in the healthcare industry, or maybe you're working with marketing and publishing. And I wanted to encourage you to think about two things. One, software is pervasive, it's everywhere. But okay, you don't need to know a lot of software. But also consider that there is technology in no matter what you do. So what is the technology in healthcare? What is the technology in publishing a book? And I mean, the processes, the steps, the regulations around it. And those are the things that will be useful in the technical excellence aspects for your team. So not just the software part, but also those other elements that make your domain very unique. So I hope this video was useful. That's all I wanted to share for now. And if you are by any chance from an industry other than software development and you want to mention like what are the challenges that you see there, I'd love to hear. Um, definitely, I can't even imagine. Or if you also are someone in the software development industry you as, as an Agile coach or a Scrum Master, but don't have much technical knowledge, what are the challenges that you are facing? How do you think that you could start encouraging your people to think about technical excellence, even though you are not the expert? So I'll stop right here and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.